good? Okay. Um, so, my name is Sage Bart Gilbert, uh, and I will be talking about my project on uh, linguistic transit in the landscape of Mapuche poetry. Um, so, the kind of overview of the project or of the presentation is that I'm going to talk, give a little bit of like background info about what um, the like what genre Mapuche poetry, how we define this genre, um, and the uh, kind of critical discussion of the genre, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about my project, and then if we have time at the end, uh, we can look at some of the poetry itself. Um, I guess a little bit about me is that I studied, my undergrad was at the University of Denver. Um, I studied English and environmental science. Um, and I am currently working on a master's at the University of Denver in literary studies. Um, and so this project will be uh, kind of building towards my thesis for this literary studies master's. Um, so yeah, let's talk about a little bit of the uh, background. So when we're talking about Mapuche poetry, although um, the Mapuche are, so they are the largest indigenous group in Chile. They represent about, or comprise about 10% of the population. Um, and although they have been producing um, written work, uh, right, Mapuche intellectuals have been producing work uh, since the early uh, 1900s, um, when we're talking about Mapuche poetry, it's like a specific genre that starts around the time of the like democratic return to Chile at the end of the uh, dictatorship, so around 1990. Um, and this uh, this was kind of marked by Lino Lienlaf's uh, publication of Sea Despertado el Ave en mi Corazón um, in 1989. Um, and he, this was kind of like the first kind of landmark work uh, in the genre, he got a lot of national recognition for this publication uh, and was awarded the like municipal Santiago's municipal oh, what is it called uh, literature prize, which is like kind of a big national award. Um, and then he was followed by Elicura Chihuahua uh, in 1995, um, and uh, he also was awarded this same like kind of prestigious national literary prize. Um, and this was happening at the same time um, as the passage of this Ley Vigina in 1993. So kind of to like discuss this, you have to go back and talk about like a whole bunch of history. And obviously this is very limited, but um, the Mapuche resisted um, the like, resisted colonization for like an incredibly long time. Um, up until uh, the 1880s, they, after a treaty, let me see if I have it written down, um, a treaty in 1641, um, there was like a Mapuche territory established south of the Bio Bio River, and they defended that territory um, up until the 1880s, and it was like about 5 million hectares. Um, and then there was the simultaneous military invasions from the Chilean state and the Argentinian state, which was the pacification of the Araucania and the conquest of the desert in Argentina. Um, and the like, kind of overwhelming violence of these two invasions uh, defeated the Mapuche and all of that land was taken by the Chilean state and the Argentinian state. And they gave back like 475,000 hectares um, to some uh, Mapuche uh, individuals. So, uh, and then over the course of the 20th century, there was quite a lot of um, work by the Chilean government and by private entities to take the remaining part of that land. Um, and this included under Pinochet declaring uh, communal land, uh, like separating it and putting it into individual holdings that could be more easily taken by the government and by private entities. Um, so the way in Dijina was to some extent an attempt by the government to uh, deal with that um, kind of history of violence and uh, land uh, kind of stealing by the government. So it kind of enshrined, or it attempted to, um, it committed the state to protecting and promoting the development of indigenous people here. And it also created uh, Comunari, which is the um, corporation for the development of indigenous people. 
Um, and this corporation is supposed to like negotiate between the government and the Mapuche and other indigenous people in Chile. Um, and it, to some extent, like has been helpful, but has also created its own set of problems. Um, and so the other uh, term that I thought I'd introduce here is Walmapu, which is uh, kind of work by uh, Mapuche activists over the last 30 years to kind of imagine and then work towards what a Mapuche, an internet, like a cross-border Mapuche nation would look like. Um, and so this is like the work of both activists and also artists and um, just people in general like imagining how to reclaim that kind of historical territory. Um, and uh, so I guess the, so yeah, I'll talk about where I am in this project and what my kind of goals are with it. Um, so I have, most of my research so far has focused on the um, kind of academic uh, approach to this, like how it's discussed um, in the wider or in the wider critical discourse. Um, so that's been work towards my prospectus. Um, and then now that I'm here, um, I will begin kind of a significant amount of like literary analysis. Um, study of the Mapuche language Mapudungun and building relationships um, with Mapuche authors. Um, I am going to be located at the University of Concepcion um, in southern Chile and I will be working with uh, Dr. Susan Foote who is a professor of Mapuche literature um, as well as Claudio Gonzalez Pada who is in the sociology department but is um, a Mapuche um, intellectual, and between um, them, they have like a really significant network of connections, and um, can help with like one of the most significant obstacles that I've encountered so far in approaching the work is that it's like really hard to find these books, uh, especially in the U.S. Like they're not really like sold anywhere. Through like s several like interlibrary loans, I found a couple, um, but I haven't been able to actually access a lot of the text. So Susan Foote has like a personal library that I will be able to access, um, which is important because like even here I've been looking for the books in various bookstores and you can find like pretty much one author and it's Lionel Lienlaf. And so uh, it's like important to have these connections just to be able to access a lot of this work. Um, and so the first part of it is just like reading and analyzing the texts and um, learning the way that this is discussed within Chile because a lot of the academic work that I've had access to is like the way that it is discussed outside of Chile. So it's there's kind of like these different levels um, that I have to negotiate there. Um, and then July through November of my project, um, I will be doing five to 10 semi-structured interviews with the authors to kind of um, get their perspective. And the um, research questions that I'm dealing with, well, okay, I guess I'll talk about um, the kind of like key concepts that are in the academic literature around this topic um, and kind of the framings that people use to approach it. So neoliberal multiculturalism, or I guess I should say, as the poetry has had like this kind of um, cultural moment, there has sprung up a wide discussion of it in academia. Um, and these are the general frames, I'd say, that are very common. And between like 20, 2000 and 2010, there's quite a bit of discussion of neoliberal multiculturalism. Um, and th these are kind of like buzzwords that are then pushed together. But uh, it has a specific meaning here because this like uh, indigenous special law from 1993 enshrined like a, uh, the government working to promote and protect indigenous peoples, um, which led to a lot of this kind of like multicultural discourse of like celebrating um, like ethnic cultures in Chile. Um, but at the same time, so it, this led to something like in the early 2000s, Ricardo Lagos, the president, quoting from um, Mapuche, like prominent Mapuche poets in his speeches, while at the same time prosecuting um, Mapuche activists using the anti-terrorism laws that had been passed under Pinochet. So it's kind of this like dual thing of ex kind of opening up 
indigenous lands further to development while celebrating in a like uh, limited way the like diversity of the nation. So that's kind of like what a lot of the academic um, discussion was at that point. Um, in the last 10 years, I'd say there's been a little bit more published about postcolonial eco-criticism, which is another like couple like buzzwords like jammed together. Um, but this would be more about writing about the way that like Mapuche people are using or Mapuche authors are using their poetry to relate to the environment and to protect the, the environment. Um, and uh, the other kind of maybe most important um, academic trend is this kind of like the discussion of decoloniality and decolonization and this is even more recent I would say and overall this is like um, Mapuche authors and intellectuals themselves discussing the way that they're like the creating critical frameworks to discuss their own poetry um, and so this is kind of like an incredibly important aspect of the research um, so I will kind of be engaging with all of these in my research and trying to see what has happened in the last like five years as the uh, government has shifted from a more like center left um, uh, kind of approach to uh, Pinera's more right wing kind of approach and they have very different implications for the way that um, Mapuche culture is discussed and kind of an increased militarization in Mapuche lands with um, the like kind of significant conflicts between police and Mapuche activists. Um, so that's kind of the general uh, thing of my project. Um, within the methodology, I have to like my positionality as a like white researcher from the U.S. is like incredibly important and like the um, the greatest point of like personal journey and thought that I have to lend to this and kind of like seeing uh, there's a, a academic Arturo Arias who writes a lot about academic colonization and kind of the history of um, uh, academics from the U.S. and from European centers going to study indigenous communities and extracting the knowledge and then going back and never using it or like never having any sort of like accountability or follow through and like achieving great pro professional success. So um, I, I guess this project for me is trying to figure out if there is a way to um, connect with uh, or to discuss indigenous poetry as a white researcher and to study it that is not harmful and would hopefully in fact like further the interests of the authors that I'm uh, going to be working with um, and I think that like part of that uh, knowledge is like being willing to stop and to not publish and to like to pull back if it seems like the things that I am trying to study are not possible to study um, so yeah, and I thought that I would show a couple examples. So this is a really awesome poem by Lorenzo uh, Ailepan, and um, he is kind of, I think, there's several generational shifts. I mean, over 30 years, there's been several generational shifts. He's kind of an older poet, and this is kind of a very classic structure. Um, on the page, you would have the Mapudungan on the left and the uh, Spanish on the right, and um, it's part of this whole like language project of uh, forwarding the study of Mapudungun, um, and it also deals like quite heavily with um, nature and with geography. And a lot of his work is like discussing like specific geographic markers along rivers and stuff like that. So um, I think that that provides a good example. Um, and then I'll try to quickly compare it to this is by Cesar Milaweke, and so. He, He's kind of a, a later generation. He's still like, at this point, he's like in his 50s, I think. Um, but he was considered like a younger uh, Mapuche poet. And so his, he's still dealing like with these very like rich natural images, but he is also kind of negotiating his uh, location as like an urban author and the cultural like, or like the, the technological worlds that he also has to negotiate in his life. So um, that's like very, very brief, but I think it provides a good example of some of the work um, that I will be reading. And so I think that's all my time.